and uh, let's start with uh, this presentation um, that Carlos uh, has introduced. So, um, looking at the outline of the presentation, we will first um, uh, introduce the, the multi-junction concept, uh, explain the, the need in general uh, for th this, this would be um, uh, valid for any photovoltaic device, but it, we will try to focus on the need for electrical characterization of uh, multi-junction solar cells. And then we will focus on the um, spectral response, um, in particular quantum efficiency of uh, these multi-junction devices, uh, which is one of the, um, the key uh, characterization techniques. Uh, uh, then, secondly, I, I will introduce electroluminescence, another um, key uh, characterization uh, regarding this type of, of structure. Well, um, let's see how. Okay. Regarding um, uh, multi junction solar cells. Okay. Uh, we have this um, very popular chart, efficiency chart, in which uh, all the uh, photovoltaic technologies are uh, shown as a function of their efficiency uh, and the year when uh, they were achieved. And I just want to, um, I think this arrow, you, you, I think you see this arrow. I, I, was, I just want to notice that uh, most uh, uh, PV technologies uh, that uh, are located in the higher uh, range of the of the efficiency, the ones that provide higher efficiency, have a um, multi-junction configuration. In particular, most of these are um, based on three five materials. We have other novel uh, concepts. Uh, for instance, the ones in, uh, that are based on inorganic uh, solar, uh, sorry, organic solar cells. Uh, such as perovskite, which also use um, multi-junction configurations. So why, why is, the, is this um, multi-junction concept so important? Let's see what is, what is it interesting uh, uh, about it. Uh, the, the concept uh, relies on um, uh, applying a set of materials, of semiconductor materials with different band gaps. Uh, so in this graph, in this uh, figure, we see the, um, the sun um, and uh, the sunlight divided uh, in different uh, photons with different energies. So we would place the first um, a material, in which will have the form of a P injection, of course, and has a high band gap that will absorb the photons. Uh, sorry, where is the arrow? Here. Uh, will, which, uh, which will absorb high energy photons and will be transparent to lower energy photons that will be absorbed. Part of them will be absorbed in the second uh, subcell, and, uh, this, and, and, and the same will happen for lower energy infrared photons that will be absorbed in the bottom cell. So, um, with this scheme, uh, we achieve high efficiency because we absorb and uh, we, ca we can collect a, a, a broader band of the solar spectrum. And we, we not only do this, because this can be done by this idea, can be done, can be implemented with a low band gap semiconductor, but with the multi-junction concept, we um, uh, absorb these photons, uh, making a, an efficient use of the electrochemical energy of, of such photons. Uh, this, is, this means that uh, we uh, obtain a high voltage in each subcell uh, uh, out of the energy of these photons, providing thus providing a uh, high efficiency. Actually, if we want to compare the efficiency of a multi-junction uh, structure with um, conventional single gap uh, solar cell, we can uh, look at these. Uh, figure, um, sorry, we can look at this figure in which uh, we compare the Sokle-Quasher efficiency limit for a single gap solar cell 
um, under the, the pay balance realm, uh, providing a, uh, around 40% efficiency for a single gas uh, uh, solar cell. And comparing it to a multi junction structure, we can obtain under the same radiative limit, this is, a, this is um, a, an ideal efficiency limit, uh, and also calculated for maximum concentration. And in this case, under these same assumptions, comparing single gap solar cells to multi junction solar cells, we obtain a significantly higher uh, efficiency limit. Actually, um, uh, in the limit, with an infinite number of, of subcells, we would obtain almost uh, an 87% of efficiency. So, um, and state of the art solar cells use either three or four junctions. So we see that um, under this uh, concept, we can um, obtain um, much larger efficiencies compared to conventional solar cells. So the, that's the interest of um, fabricating, designing, and characterizing uh, such concepts. So how can we, let's see, how can we implement uh, a multi-junction solar cell? We can rely either on uh, independent devices, uh, and we can think of a, a spectrum splitting configuration in which we, um, uh, we have different independent and isolated uh, solar cells, uh, single gap solar cells, PN junctions, with different band gaps that absorb the different components, spectral components of the light that we have previously split it uh, with, um, with some optical, for instance, refractive uh, uh, device. And we can also think of um, a multi-junction structure in a um, uh, mechanical stack tandem configuration. Uh, actually, under this approach, in both, actually in both of them, we use several substrates, which is uh, more expensive, and um, uh, that, that, is, um, that is a drawback, but uh, at least we have, um, sorry, at least we have, um, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, under this approach, uh, it, the, uh, the, the devices are difficult to integrate into, um, into a PD system, but, but uh, they are easy to operate each of them because we have two, ter because we have two, two terminals for each of them. Um, comparing these approaches of independent devices with uh, the more usual single device in a two-terminal monolithic uh, implementation, we have uh, the conventional um, configuration for the multi-junction solar cells that are uh, conventionally used by the industry and uh, um, they, they are commercial devices. In this case, they are easier to integrate and to, uh, to integrate into a system. So the engineering of a system is easier because of these two, just uh, uh, two terminals, but they're uh, slightly more complicated uh, in architecture and operation. As we will see, they uh, require uh, the different PM junctions of different materials with different band gaps uh, in this monolithic configura configuration and the, and the series connection of, of, of such PN junctions uh, impose uh, certain restrictions that we will um, see next. Uh, actually, this is how um, this is this is how a multi-junction structure in monolithic con configuration in, an, in a two-terminal configuration looks like. Um, we uh, we we want to. Um, um, to show that between every single PN junction, we need uh, a device uh, called tunnel, tunnel junction. Uh, it is shown here, uh, which are uh, required so that we don't have uh, the, the different PN junctions uh, in, in reverse. Uh, this complicates the structure, but allows extracting um, a high voltage. Uh, so, um, regarding the fabrication of, the, of the, these devices, uh, 
we only use one substrate. Uh, we, we require uh, fabricating these tunnel junctions between subcells. Uh, and we need to implement some band gap uh, engineering uh, regarding the spectrum, the solar spectrum that will uh, that will be used uh, in the in, in each uh, structure. Actually, uh, we we have a restriction that every subcell has to be lattice matched. They have to be they, they have to have the same lattice constant uh, this would be the lattice match approach uh, which um, is uh, an important restriction regarding the available materials uh, uh, with which we can design our uh, solar cell in in the state of the air solar cell we use triple or quadruple uh, multi-junction structures and uh, the, these uh, gallium indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, and germanium uh, configuration is the typical um, lattice match approach. Uh, and we can also think of um, lattice mismatch approach uh, with some of the subcells slightly deviated from the, the lattice constant of the substrate. We, we call these structures uh, metamorphic. So, um, a little bit more in detail. This, um, uh, this, multi this uh, lattice match uh, multi junction approach uh, ha has all these uh, um, epitaxial layers. We, and I, I want to show that it, uh, it's a quite complicated structure. It has many layers and it's not easy to fabricate nor to operate. We will see that the characterization of such devices. Um, requires a special attention uh, and we will review um, as, as we have said in particular in detail uh, uh, spec um, spectral response and electronic sense uh, so let's see these challenges well just uh, to finish with the uh, introduction on multi-junction solar cells here um, there is a plot of all the um, all the configurations or some of the configurations we we uh, use either in a uh, laboratory scale or in at the industrial scale. This is the one on the left uh, is the typical triple junction lattice match approach. Um, the the next one is a four junction solar cell. Uh, which relies on a, a, on, on a gallium indium nitride arsenide subcell, which uh, is usually problematic regarding the, electro the electronic properties. So, um, some years ago, there was um, um, a company called Solar Junction in, in America that uh, fabricated this structure, but required, with, with high efficiency, they actually obtained... Um, the wall record for for um, a multi-junction structure, but they require the use of two different epitaxial reactors. Actually, they, these structures are usually uh, fabricated with MOCD, but they require uh, transporting the, the substrate during uh, epitaxial growth to an MBE um, um, epitaxial reactor. So these is quite complicated. An MBE was required to grow the this uh, PN junction, this second um, PN junction with uh, high quality. We have then this um, six junction uh, structure. This has all this this has only been um, uh, designed and fabricated for at laboratory scale because it's quite complicated. We don't. Uh, obtain high efficiency out of it, at least not as high as uh, conventional um, uh, structures. And we have to pay attention to uh, inclu including so many junctions in a multi-junction configuration because the higher the number of, uh, of PN junctions, the, um, the higher the sensitivity to changes in the solar spectrum, which uh, may reduce the, the efficiency uh, when uh, some 
when when something uh, it modifies just an external uh, because of uh, some atmospheric uh, reason or uh, any or any other uh, feature of the solar cell, the spectrum is uh, modified. The, the solar cell would, would render a much lower efficiency. The fourth approach is um, an upright um, metamorphic uh, configuration relying on a germanium substrate. But since the germanium, actually in the conventional lattice match structure, the germanium produces a much higher uh, photocarbons. So since, we will see this concept afterwards, but since all subcells in the multi-junction stack are series connected, the, um, the subcell producing the lower photocarbon limits the whole structure. So in the case of the lattice match approach, the, all the uh, extra photocarbon produced by the germanium will be wasted. Uh, and this uh, metamorphic configuration um, seeks uh, a more efficient use of the spectrum, uh, reducing the light absorbed by the germanium uh, and thus increasing the photocarbon generated by the rest of the junctions. And the overall uh, photocarbon of the, of, the, of the device would be uh, uh, further increased. Uh, in, and the last, um, the, the last structure to, be, to show here, what's wrong with the, I don't get the arrow work. Okay. Well, the last uh, structure is uh, an inverted uh, metamorphic uh, multi-junction solar cell that is shown here afterwards. For some reason, I don't get the, the arrow. Well, there is some problem with the arrow. Well, um, ah, okay, here. A, this is just a sketch of the uh, inverted uh, metamorphic um, configuration in which we grow epitaxially uh, the, the top cell in first place and then uh, the middle and then the bottom. Then we remove the substrate, we mount the structure on a, on a virtual uh, substrate and we implement the front grid metallization on the uh, on the top junction. So we uh, illuminate it from, uh, from the rear side, actually, from, from, well, from the top junction that was first uh, grown, I mean. Uh, this is a high efficiency concept that has reached, uh, at the time, was the, was the record efficiency solar cell. And uh, nowadays, the most efficiency, the most efficient uh, device is the quadruple uh, uh, multi-junction solar cell uh, fabricated by um, uh, Soitec in collaboration with um, with Fraunhofer and CA and Hempel Centrum, I think. And this solar cell is uh, first grown in two different uh, substrates. One of them, the indium phosphide uh, one and the gallium arsenide one, and they are, the two subcells are grown on top of, of each uh, substrate, and they are later wafer bonded. Uh, this is a slightly complicated process, but has rendered efficiencies up to 46%. So uh, let's uh, review why uh, we need electrical characterization in, in, in in general, in solar cells, and in particular, with uh, as regards of multi-junction devices. Well, uh, during the growth of these structures, which um, are, well, the ones we will refer to are based on 3-5 materials, well, sometimes grown on a germanium substrate, but we call them 3-5 multi-junction solar cells. And they require, as it has been uh, explained, um, an epitaxial reactor and a quite complicated process, uh, gr growth process. Such a growth process has to be characterized, uh, for instance, with the transmission electron microscopy. So we need to um, 
feedback this growth process and this can be one of the uh, requirements during the production of a solar cell. Another one would be once the wafer, um, um, one, once the solar cell um, has been, uh, when the solar cell layer, stack of layer, taxial uh, growth has been carried out, uh, the engineer requires fabricating the, uh, the device. So uh, this means uh, implementing uh, electrical contacts and um, mess, uh, implementing the mesas, um, uh, anti-reflecting coatings, etc. Uh, for instance, this characterization, this TLM, transmission line method, uh, is aimed at uh, optimizing the contact resistance. So this is also required during the fabrication process. Uh, another uh, need for characterization uh, is during um, during the cell encapsulation. What once we have the the wafer uh, uh, pitaxid and the solar cell fabricated, we need to dice the cells and solder them into the proper um, receiver. Uh, this uh, implies. Uh, Mm, soldering, wire bonding, and connection of cables, etc. Uh, sometimes uh, putting some uh, some secondary uh, secondary optical elements, etc. During this uh, encapsulation, we can monitor the, uh, for instance, the dark IV curve of the solar cell to try to find out whether we are introducing um, defects or we are degrading the structure, okay? This is another uh, situation in which we require characterization. Uh, uh, characterization of the devices can be also necessary uh, in order to understand the different mechanisms um, driving the performance of, of, the, of the device. And this is an example of the influence of, on temperature of temperature on um, a triple junction uh, structure. Another uh, situation would be the optimization of the cell performance in order to feedback the, the fabrication process. Uh, either the epitaxial growth, the design of the epitaxial layers, as well as the fabrication of the uh, different components of the solar cell, electrical contacts, etc. Uh, these would require Mm, relative and absolute characterization of the of the solar cell. I'm meaning that uh, relative with relative characterization. I mean that uh, some figures, some characterization figures of merit can be obtained, and we can compare. We can optimize the structure and compare against them. But uh, sometimes an absolute reference is required in order to compare your results, the results you are obtaining this uh, fabrication process with the state of the art, with uh, other laboratories, for instance. Uh, in this case, this is a plot of uh, the cell efficiency as a function of the grid line spacing. This is uh, just one, one example. And finally, um, power rating may be uh, also um, require uh, characterization, of course. Uh, and in this case, we are always referring to absolute um, absolute characterization. In this case, we uh, we are showing uh, the record uh, double junction solar cell produced here at uh, the Solar Energy Institute uh, some years ago, and we plot uh, the VOC fill factor and efficiency against um, concentration versus concentration. So. Um, with power rating, we can uh, give absolute figures for um, for the devices we are fabricating, and we will uh, enable comparison with um, similar structures fabricate, fa fabricated and designed elsewhere. So, features regarding multijunction characterization. Let's review some of them. Um, multijunction is strongly dependent on the type of cell structure. Um, characterization, characterization systems require fine-tuning in order to adapt 
to particular multi-junction configurations, as we will see, the different band gaps uh, in the structure require uh, different settings of the um, characterization system. Uh, then different standards apply as regards of the, of the cell final use. Um, there are different standards depending on whether the cell will be used uh, for space applications, for terrestrial applications, the temperature can change, the spectrum, etc., or the concentration. Um, some of the characterization techniques are related with each other, as we will see, uh, for instance, quantum efficiency is used to calibrate solar simulators, and solar simulators are used to obtain IV curves under illumination, with different spectrums, etc. Proper absolute references are required for power rating and round robin testing. We need uh, some calibrated references. We will see that in, in the setup uh, that we will show afterwards. Uh, there is a, a difficult to characterize novel uh, multi junction structures uh, so that uh, these novel or new structures require tuning on, of the characterization systems. We have already mentioned that. And uh, it is important uh, the, that the, the to characterize the system in stability. Uh, for instance, the lamp or the detector uh, can degrade, and this may modify the, uh, the res final results we obtain uh, uh, with this characterization. So, uh, in general, we can try to assess the errors of our measurements. So, we can give um, a result with the um, uh, uh, corresponding error. Uh, okay, so let's begin with um, the main characterization technique that we will review in this course. It is spectral response. It is defined it is defined as the ratio of the carbon generated by the solar cell to the power incident on it. Uh, and it is measured on amperes per watt. Uh, this is a nice plot from this uh, very useful um, web, uh, website um, in which we see how this spectral response uh, depends on the uh, lambda, okay? Um, meaning that uh, it is a function of, of lambda uh, and uh, we will see the formula afterwards. Uh, I just want to point out that compared to the quantum efficiency, uh, it, which is the ratio of the number of carriers collected by the solar cell to the numbers to the number of photons of a given energy incident on the solar cell, uh, it is dimensionless. Um, in this case, this is just. Uh, the, the ratio of the number of, of, of carriers uh, versus the, the, photo, the photons. So we have to measure both. Uh, we will see uh, a sketch of the setup. How do we do it? But anyway, the quantum efficiency is important because it's like the identity card of, of, the, of the device. And actually, we can know how the different, uh, different uh, how photons with different energy um, um, are absorbed and collected, and how can we um, modify or uh, upgrade our solar cell in order to improve the absorption and collection of uh, such photons. Um, these are the key ideas. As I have mentioned, it is the identity card of the solar cell. Uh, it tells us how well photons are being absorbed and collected. It can be referred to the incident photons or the transmitted photons within the solar cells, depending on the type of measurement. We can refer to a external quantum efficiency or internal quantum efficiency, in which we have subtracted the reflection. Uh, so the internal just um, um, takes into account the photons that has, have been transmitted into the solar cell. Uh, so uh, the spectral response and quantum efficiency are related to each other. To this equation, as this is what I meant before, the uh, spectral response uh, is similar to quantum efficiency, ex except for it is multiplied by by lambda and for and by a constant. Uh, th this is why it had this um, this this trend uh, as a function of, of lambda. 
Uh, and a very important key idea is that uh, the spectral response allows us to infer the photo generated current uh, for a given spectrum. We, uh, we integrate uh, well, either um, spectral response or quantum efficiency with a um, particular um, light distribution of light, in this case, a solar spectrum between two different wavelengths, and we obtain photo generated current. And the different features that we will uh, try to review in this, in this course are listed here. Spectral resolutions, signal intensity, amplification, noise level, temperature, time constant, detector calibration, light bias, voltage bias, land stability, spot homogeneity, straight light, secondary artifacts, radiative coupling. All these are uh, features that will impact this uh, type of characterization. So this is the setup used for quantum efficiency. We begin with a light bias. Sorry, we begin by um, a white light uh, that we filter um, uh, out, you know, in all, because we would try to select uh, every lambda one by one. And uh, for that purpose, we first filter uh, possible harmonics uh, uh, for, for each lambda. We chop the light in order to make uh, an AC, an alternative component. Uh, that will be further detected uh, with a locking amplifier uh, that requires a modulated signal. Then uh, the light is uh, uh, inserted into a monochromator that selects, that splits the spectrum and uh, enables uh, selecting one particular lambda. And depending on the aperture of, of the output of the monochromator, depending on the uh, sleep separation, uh, we can tune Mm, uh, uh, we can tune the spectrum width uh, that we select. Then we have different detectors. Main detector is, in this case, this is just a particular configuration and, and every other uh, quantum efficiency setup could be implementing, it could be, could be implemented um, uh, otherwise. In, in this case, photons, uh, the, the denominator of the quantum efficiency, the number of photons are detected uh, after being transmitted uh, through this beam splitter, um, we know the ratio of light that, uh, in this case, the monochromatic light that uh, is transmitted or reflected by this beam splitter, and we can know how many uh, photons we are uh, we are uh, reflecting towards the solar cell, our uh, dude, our uh, test sample. So. Um, we have another detector, which is also calibrated, uh, you know, that is used for the reflected component in case we want to measure uh, internal quantum efficiency. So, uh, but things, this is, uh, this is general for, for every uh, quantum efficiency setup uh, of a conventional solar cell, but in our case, we, um, in, in our case, for a multi-junction structure, we require a light bias, a light bias, uh, which uh, we, we will go into details afterwards, but we need to separate this light into different spectral components in order to illuminate the solar cell with a particular spectrum. Uh, then we need a chiller to control temperature. We, need, we may need a vacuum pump in order to, um, in order to uh, set the, the solar cell uh, to the chuck and, and control temperature appropriately. And you know the, the solar cell mm, does not move uh, during the measurement, and uh, we have to say that we can measure either a, a solar cell within a wafer with the uh, help of um, probes, Kelvin probes, or just a solar cell uh, within a, a, a receiver. Uh, then we have a voltage uh, source with which we will bias the the solar cell. And we will have different um, amplifiers because even if the power, the incident power, the the, the power of the light we use in first instance is is very large, we are reducing the power because we select 
because many reasons, but uh, among others, because we select a very narrow uh, spectral band for for it, and and we have. I, I want to. What I mean is that we have very low signals, and in order to uh, improve the um, the signal to noise ratio, we we use this. Uh, um, amplifiers uh, that, as I have said, uh, use this modulated signal. We control everything by a PC. So, um, this is how it looks like uh, in reality. This is the um, quantum efficiency setup uh, actually in uh, the facilities at INES in the CPB laboratory at CEA in France, where I spent. Uh, spend uh, almost three years, um, and has all the elements that we have just mentioned. Okay, this is this uh, in particular. We will focus on the uh, light bias, which are made of uh, halogen lamps filtered out by different bandpass filters and coupled with uh, uh, optical fiber uh, that is directed towards the solar cell, and also a source meter that allows biasing uh, electrically biasing the device. So, uh, regarding the definitions, uh, the quantum, we, we, we can think of different uh, types of, of quantum efficiency. Uh, it can be either absolute or relative, depending on whether uh, it has been scaled up to one, this would be relative, or it is an absolute reference. Uh, this would be the, both the red and the blue. And the difference between them is, as we have already mentioned, that the red one is the um, absolute internal quantum efficiency, and the blue one is the uh, absolute uh, external quantum efficiency. The red one is larger because it only takes into account the photons that have been uh, transmitted to the solar zone. So we subtract in the denominator, we subtract the uh, reflected component. A regarding light bias, which is one of the most important features of, um, of, a multi of um, quantum efficiency um, characterization, uh, this is how it looks like, a quantum efficiency of a triple junction solar cell, a, a, con a conventional a lattice match uh, multi-junction configuration in which we have top, middle, and bottom cell. Uh, in general, gallium indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, or gallium indium arsenide with uh, small amounts of indium, and a, germ and a, a germanium subcell. Actually, the substrate is made of, of germanium. Um, so, uh, regarding light bias, we have to uh, now understand that all, or remember that uh, all subcells in this structure are series connected. Um, and therefore, in, in, in the we, for the quantum efficiency, you, we measure, uh, we, we don't measure all together, we measure one by one, the subcells one by one. So, in order, since they are all um, series connected, in order, uh, in order to detect uh, one subcell at a time, we need to make it um, limit the performance of the whole device. How do we do it? Well, we over-illuminate, if we want, for instance, to measure top cell, we over-illuminate middle and bottom cell so that the top cell is limiting the photocurrent of the device and the device will uh, respond as the top cell. We do the same thing for the middle and for the bottom. Uh, for over-illuminating the subcells that we are not uh, using in, in every... Um, in, in, in for the measurement of every subcell, uh, we can use either uh, sorry either LED, um, LEDs or lasers or filter white white light. We will see some examples, uh, and then in um, in theory uh, for um, uh, strictly uh, well uh, characterized quantum efficiency, we would need to bias the solar cell under measurement with one sun. So we should illuminate the cell we are measuring uh, with, uh, with one sun and therefore the other ones with uh, a, higher, um, a higher illumination that produces a higher photocurrent. 
uh, this can be either implemented or not. Uh, there, there are this in general is this. This is not always um, implemented uh, because the response of, of these subcells is linear and does not depend uh, on the uh, photocurrent produced by the cell, the subcell under test. Uh, then, uh, regarding light bias, its intensity, the light bias intensity of the subcells that we are not uh, measuring and we need to eliminate, uh, it's very important. This intensity um, will produce uh, artifacts in case there are, for instance, uh, bad uh, shunt resistances. This means uh, low low shunt resistance in the in one of the subcell in the subcell under measurement, or in case there is a radiative coupling. Uh, we will see some other examples uh, of artifacts, the ones produced by low. Um, breakdown voltage, but these do not uh, depend in general uh, on the uh, light intensity or no, not in such a direct way. Uh, these are the different um, uh, bias lights that we can use, either LEDs, lasers, or a white line. In this case, it's a halogen lamp with some, fil uh, some uh, bandpass filters coupled with uh, um, optical fiber and directed to the solar cell. So um, regarding this third, um, this third approach, which is the one used in the setup that we have shown before, uh, we, for, as we have said, for the measurement of the top cell, in this case, we need to place a filter in uh, uh, the optical um, path of, of the light a filter that uh, blocks most of the light, all the light or most of the light, depending on the uh, one sun uh, biasing strategy or not on the cell, sub cell under measurement, uh, and that transmits all the light towards the, the, the cell, the sub cells that we are not measuring uh, in, in that case. For the middle cell, it is uh, equivalent. We would illuminate top and bottom cells. So we would place. Um, so in this case, we would need probably um, two sources of light that would be the simplest. Uh, one of them mm, for the top cell and one for the bottom. And in the third case, for measuring the bottom cell, uh, in this triple junction configuration, we need a filter that transmits the light. Uh, in the in the high energy range, in the low wavelength range. Um, so we can think, what is a good bias light? Well, a good bias light for the char characterization of a multi-junction uh, device would be one that it is intense enough because as we have said, uh, we have mentioned uh, shunt resistant artifacts and luminescent coupling are dependent on the intensity. Actually, the higher the intensity, uh, the lower this uh, shunt resistant artifact, as we will see, and um, the higher the uh, bias light intensity, the higher luminescent coupling. But at least, even if this, uh, the artifact um, that has to do with the luminescent coupling uh, increases with uh, increasing the, the light bias, uh, we can uh, characterize uh, this luminescent coupling with uh, a, a bias light intense enough. Uh, so it is, this is why it is important. Uh, the spot dimension, uh, the fact that the spot dimension is tunable is also important because we may measure or characterize cells with different sizes. Um, and it's, it, uh, it will require the uh, that the light is spectrally tunable uh, because we may have a system adapted to a particular uh, subcell configuration. But um, if mm, we are told to measure, to characterize a solar cell with a different band gap distribution, we would need uh, uh, lights with different uh, spectral mm, contents. 
is, as we have said, we need a variable intensity. We need the bias light to be stable over time. And we need them to be simple to operate because we, during the measurement, we will be uh, modifying the light bias uh, many, many times. So uh, this for the light bias. Uh, and then for the voltage bias, uh, we require, um, we, uh, we have to say that during the measurement of the uh, source uh, of the multi-junction device, the social lambda test may be in reverse bias. We will see why. Uh, and the problem is that there is no physical access to each individual subcell terminals, so we cannot bias um, uh, individually each subcell. Um, but the problem is that we cannot know uh, the individual IV curves of the uh, of the car of the cell cells, so of the sub cells. So uh, we we would we will need to estimate them. Uh, we, he let's see because this. Becoming a bit crazy. What's wrong? With it? Okay. Uh, we see here uh, these IV curves for each subcell that we have mentioned that we don't have. They they may have these uh, these shapes. Okay. We we cannot know them, but we can estimate and we we can estimate them and we can think that they 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 may have these shapes. Okay. They, this would be. The red one would be the bottom IV, IV curve, the green one the, the middle IV curve, and the blue one the, the top IV curve. In this case, we, we would be measuring top cell, top cell. And what I wanted to, to show is that uh, if we don't apply a voltage bias, uh, since the top cell is limiting the, the photocurrent, the, the multi-junction photocurrent, it will bias bottom and middle cell uh, next to uh, DOC, and next to um, uh, uh, and then, <clears throat> if the applied voltage is zero, the uh, uh, the voltage bias of the cell under under test, in this case the top cell, would be reverse bias. So we need to uh, apply an output uh, voltage bias to correct this reverse biasing of the sub cell under test. Actually, vo the voltage applied to the solar cell is the sum of the three. So, if we apply a, if we uh, apply zero voltage on the terminals of the um, whole multijunction, which is which are the ones that we have access to, a uh, voltage of the top would be negative because a uh, voltage, uh, the bias voltage of the middle and the bottom cells are close to uh, open circuit voltage. And um, so, actually, we need to. This implies that we need to apply a voltage to correct this reverse biasing of the subcell under test. We need to apply a voltage that is uh, in between um, the maximum power point and the OC. The maximum power point would be here, and the VOC would be slightly to the right of the biasing uh, point uh, uh, that we are imposing. But um, for for every other subcell, but um, uh, how do we how do we do it? The problem is that uh, we we need to correct it. We need to correct this reverse biasing because this may lead to inappropriate operation of the subcell on the test that can greatly impact the quantum efficiency signature. We will see how. Actually. Um, um, the multi-junction voltage bias is very important in some important in some cases. For instance, when some of the subcells have a low voltage uh, breakdown, or a sand resistance, or uh, in 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 some cases is particularly imp important. Uh, this is a plot of uh, one of the subcells and uh, the quantum efficiency in this case of a top cell uh, with the, under different uh, voltage bias. Okay, and when the voltage bias is zero because the subcell is reverse biased, the quantum efficiency is very degraded. And um, when we increase this voltage bias, we uh, recover the quantum efficiency signature. But if we apply uh, um, a voltage too uh, too large, a too large voltage, we would further degrade the source. So we have to. Um, 
look, we have to find the appropriate uh, value for the voltage bias. And which is this uh, appropriate, appropriate value? Well, uh, actually, uh, as we, we have to, we have um, already mentioned, we need this uh, maximum power point and DOC, but this may be uh, difficult to, to obtain. We will see how. Well, indeed, sorry, in this other plot, we, we see the variation for some uh, particular wavelengths. We see the variation and on the absolute external quantum axis. We see that, we, we realize that it varies uh, uh, very much. So, um, the problem is that uh, since we cannot know them, we can, we can try to estimate these values. But uh, the problem with the maximum power point is that since we don't have these particular ID curves for the subcells, uh, this maximum power point uh, voltage is not easy to estimate. So we can uh, simplify the. What is wrong with the presentation? Sorry. We can try to uh, simplify the, the formula. Uh, only with the VOC. Um, so, uh, a simplified method for finding this open circuit voltage uh, for, for the appropriate voltage would be just uh, um, obtaining or estimating this open circuit voltage. Um, uh, an, an, an example of this, uh, of, of the measurement of a conventional superjunction source would be like that. We would uh, base the uh, estimation on the band on the band gap distribution. Actually, um, uh, we first um, add all the band gaps. We obtain a, a total band gap for uh, for the uh, multi junction solar cell, and we apply this uh, simple formula, and we obtain a coefficient for each um, for each sub cell. Then we measure the VOC of the multi junction for the light bias condition set uh, of the measure for the measurement of each subcell and we obtain a DOC um, for that particular uh, subcell and we apply the coefficient that we have calculated and we obtain the voltage that we have to apply in each case. So the, the important thing here is to calculate to, to measure the VOC for every uh, particular set uh, uh, of conditions of the measurement of the of each. Okay, sorry for the uh, small in, sorry for the interruption. Uh, we had a small problem, uh, electric electrical problem in the building. So we were saying um, we we have just talked about uh, the the method to uh, calculate the the voltage to apply uh, the bias voltage to apply for the measurement of the quantum efficiency, and uh, let's move. Uh, to uh, another type of uh, artifact that may appear in cases where um, a, the monochromatic light spot is in has a dimension on the range of the finger pitch, the finger from the front metallization. Actually, uh, depending on the position and the size of these uh, uh, spots with respect to the uh, front metallization, it could it could happen that the uh, spot of light uh, does not uh, imping um, a, a significant part of the metallization, or it could be the case that it impings on uh, some uh, significant uh, part of, of the front metallization. In both cases, the, in, in, in the two of them, the problem will be that uh, a different QE signature will be uh, um, obtained because a different part of the light impings the active area of the solar cell. Actually, uh, this is a problem caused in general by, by small light spots, um, spots, as we said, in the range of the finger pitch, and affect it, uh, we can say that it affects medium-sized cells because a large, uh, because, well, large cells um, have usually have finger pitch a finger pitch that is um, uh, large enough to place to locate the the AC monochromatic spot between two fingers, so there is no problem. Um, and 
uh, small cells um, have a finger pitch much lower than the, the monochromatic spot, um, making a representative um, uh, portion of the, of the finger being illuminated uh, with, a, with a monochromatic light. In this case, we, uh, there's no, uh, there is no influence on the position and uh, uh, orientation of the light spot because it always covers a, a similar uh, portion of the, it, it always shades a similar part of the, of the monochromatic spot. Uh, so it is important to take into account this this source of error because uh, it may impact repeatability and uh, absolute measurements. Uh, well, uh, this is a picture of the uh, sorry, where is the arrow here? This is a, a picture of the light spot. We don't see it because uh, the cell has an anti-reflecting coating, and actually. Um, we, what we see is the reflection on the front grid, on the fingers. So uh, we have made the experiment of tuning the position of the light spot by uh, modifying the position of the, of the solar cell. So the, the monochromatic spot moves and uh, covers a different portion of the, of the front grid. This is represented in this figure where this, um, the relative position between uh, the finger, uh, between the light spot and the finger is modified, and these uh, images represent the uh, part of the light spot that is reflected by uh, different parts of the fingers. And as we can see, there is an, a significant difference in the QE uh, obtained for the same wavelength just because of this artifact. Uh, so this is um, something that we should care of and in case we have uh, such a small monochromatic spot we can try to make it larger by defocusing the, this uh, monochromatic bundle uh, which um, in our system we were focusing with a refractive uh, optical element. Uh, another option is to use a pinhole. If uh, we use a pinhole that uh, allows us to put the, uh, illum the illumination spot between two fingers, we will not suffer from the reflection on the front grid. Well, um, we ha I have just mentioned this uh, optical element that concentrates the light uh, and focuses it on top of the of the solar cell. Our system has this optical element, and some systems uh, uh, use this refractive optical element. The problem is that um, the refractive optical elements uh, induce an a chromatic aberration, and this may lead to another source of errors. We will see how. Well, this is a problem um, that is not characteristic from a very, very, very small uh, cells. And the problem with the very small cells, the ones that are smaller than the monochromatic spot, is that they cannot be measured because appropriately measured, at least in an absolute way, because the, there is some light that uh, impinges out of the solar cell. But if we have a solar cell like the one in the picture, um, in which the monochromatic spot uh, one is it has been focused uh, is enclosed by the active area of the solar cell um, in principle in this case we can measure but we have to pay attention to chromatic aberration because we are uh, placing this monochromatic spot within the solar cell for that wavelet but when another wavelet is scanned chromatic aberration may produce this effect, may displace, may modify the position of the light spot out of the active area. In this case, it, ping, it pings on the, the bus. Uh, and for these wavelengths, not all the uh, light, uh, monochromatic light, 
is depending on the active area of the solar cell, which would produce a further artifact. So we have to pay attention uh, to, to this effect in case the solar cell is in the size of the monochromatic spots. Uh, this, of course, uh, impacts the absolute measurement of the, of the QE. And I think... Uh, so we have to pay attention to this. Uh, then, uh, another uh, very common art artifact, is, we can call it um, a very uh, conventional artifact, uh, is, uh, has to do with the sound resistance. In some cases, for instance, in lattice mat uh, multijunction structures, germanium bottom cell is, uh, common, um, commonly has uh, a low sound resistance, uh, which is responsible for the appearance of an artifact. Uh, this is the physics of this artifact are widely explained in the reference, and the physics are a bit uh, compli not complicated, but a bit tedious and. Uh, lie out of the scopus of, of this uh, presentation and uh, in addition we are running out of, of time. Uh, these are this, the artifacts produced by this uh, low shunt resistance don't have to be confused with other uh, features like unabsorbed light in, in a, in a multi-junction structure where the upper layers don't absorb all the light. Uh, the, there would be also an artifact in or sorry, there would be some signal in the wavelength, there may be some signal in the wavelength regions where um, the subcell is not supposed to absorb. Uh, uh, it, we don't have to confuse either with the uh, radiative coupling. Actually, this is how the artifact look, look, looks like. What we measure is the black curve, and actually it is lower intensity uh, the, the absolute quantum efficiency measured is lower than the real one. The real one is plotted in gray, uh, in a gray line, which has been corrected uh, once it has been measured with data uh, processing. Um, so this artifact reduces the shape um, in the middle part of the, uh, of the sorry, it reproduces the shape uh, when measuring the bottom cell. It typically appears in the germanium bottom cell. It, it uh, reproduces the shape of the middle cell in the wavelength range of the absorption range of the middle cell. So out of the uh, absorption range of the, the bottom cell. That's it. That is why it is an, act, uh, an artifact. Uh, and then uh, the smaller the sun resistant, the larger the artifact and the higher the uh, bias light intensity, the smaller the artifact. Um, and as we have said, this can be corrected by data processing, uh, actually through um, a method that, has, that was explained by, uh, professor, by uh, Dr. Siefer uh, in, in this conference, where it, um, it defines, uh, it defines uh, a procedure where we scale down the middle cell uh, and make it uh, coincident to the artifact and we subtract it and so that we uh, neglect this artifact and then we obtain a coefficient that we uh, apply differently to uh, scale up the uh, absorption uh, range of the bottom cell. So in the end, we have something like what we have shown afterwards, like the gray curve. In this case, the light purple curve. Okay, so this artifact can be either solved by applying a higher uh, by light intensity, but all the setups have a limit in the in the intensity. You can design the setup uh, to have a very high bias light, but uh, if the log if the sun resistance is too low, you will always have the artifact. So the only solution is to correct it afterwards. Uh, regarding radiative coupling, um, PN junction, we have to say that PN junctions are highly recombinant next to the uh, open circuit voltage. Uh, and, and the radiative recombination from larger band gap junction can be captured by smaller band gaps in the uh, multi-junction structure. Uh, this, in principle, can be 
uh, re uh, seen as a, um, a positive effect. So it is not a, a problematic. We are, um, it, it may be good for the solar cell performance because we are recycling photons. But the problem is that uh, the QE measurement imposes an artificial operating point that overestimates the radiative coupling. So the, uh, this photon um, recycling we are doing uh, uh, during the measurement of the QE, QE may not be realistic, may not be representative of the performance of the solar cell under the conditions it has been designed for. It has been designed for a spectrum which made for a light spectrum uh, that um, produces current matching uh, uh, in every subcell. And as we mentioned before for the light bias, uh, we need to impose uh, um, a higher photocurrent in the subcells that, that are not being measured during this quantum efficiency characterization. So these artificial conditions make uh, overestim an overestimation of the radiative couple. In this plot, uh, by this very interesting reference, we see uh, different radiative couplings. Uh, we, this is, these are again the IV curves that we don't know. So we plot them here because we can think of uh, the, the, the shape they may have, but we don't have access to these IV curves. In this case, top cell is limiting, so there is a radiative coupling between the middle cell, which is biased next to the uh, VOC, and this uh, en enhances the, uh, the radiative recombination. Actually, the radiative recombination may, may, uh, would be, will be a function of the um, recombination current. The recombination current is the current, the difference between in current between the uh, output current and the photogenerated current uh, mm, given by uh, the subcell sub which is um, uh, radiating, uh, emitting. Okay, so in, in the second situation, we have the uh, we have the middle cell that is limiting the structure, and uh, since the top junction is the top junction is uh, biased next to the VOC, uh, it is uh, strongly radiating photons uh, from radiative recombination towards the, the middle cell. And the middle cell suffers this uh, or is impacted by this radiative coupling. And the same thing occurs when uh, a bit more complicated situation occurs uh, for a bottom subcell limitation in which both middle and top cell uh, top cells are a uh, bias next to the their VOC and radiate from the bottom to the middle and then from the middle to the to the bottom, so from top to middle and from middle to bottom. So um, this effect, as we have mentioned, uh, produce, um, produces an artifact that is shown as a signature on the uh, spectral band uh, of um, um, adjacent of an adjacent cell, and also as a reduction of the QE signature of the subcell that is being measured. Actually, the higher the uh, photo generated current in the uh, subcell uh, that is not being measured, okay. In this case, on the this is this is the signature of the middle cell, and so we are over illuminating. This bias line is illuminating the top cell, and the higher the photocurrent on the top cell, the larger the artifact. Okay, uh, so uh, the higher the bias light, the stronger the artifact. The artifact has a double effect, lowering the signature of the subcell QE uh, uh, on its absorption range and showing a signal out of the absorption range. And this can be understood. This artifact can be understood using a small signal uh, analysis uh, that, uh, in the end, makes us understand this this effect. It is very well explained in this in this reference by uh, Lim et al. Um, and different methods have been um, have been proposed in order to 
characterize this luminescent coupling uh, strength or this lu this luminescent coupling effect in order to extract it from the from the QE measurement and obtain the appropriate uh, uh, QE signature. The appropriate QE signature without an overestimated uh, um, uh, radiative or luminescent coupling is important because with the QE, as we have said, we will tune the uh, solar simulators, for instance. So uh, it is very important to correct this uh, uh, overestimated luminescent or radiative coupling. Uh, this, the reference on the left proposes a, pro a procedure to correct this artifact that is based on um, a spectrometer and this, the one on the right uh, proposes um, a procedure uh, tuning the light via the different light biases and increasing the intensity of the light bias uh, of the subcell that is radiating and uh, obtaining uh, a factor for the a different factor for each luminescent coupling, and then uh, with some uh, equations we can uh, subtract this radiative coupling and obtain the appropriate figures. Uh, then uh, this just to mention that this radiative coupling can can make in um, in some situation when when this radiative coupling is it's uh, uh, very strong. In this case, we have. The measurement, uh, in this case, we are measuring this, the bottom subcell, which has this uh, current here, this photocurrent, and actually it has a low voltage breakdown. But we, through um, luminescent coupling, we increase the photocurrent in the bottom cell up to a point where it's no longer limiting the structure. In this case, if we uh, over illuminate the uh, top junction so that uh, the radiative coupling is is um, high enough to make the junction we are measuring not to limit the performance, we will no longer see the signature of the bottom of sound. In this case, uh, it will be impossible to measure. So we have to pay attention to the light, the bias light that we are, um, the, that um, with which we are biasing the other subcells. And the last uh, artifact that we will review is the one caused by break a low break sorry, breakdown voltage, uh, such as the one we see in the red curve, for instance, or in the black curve. Actually, uh, it may happen that because of the high topping of, of the base of the, in this case, the bottom subcell, it, it is uh, common also in the germanium. Uh, bottom subcell of the lattice match uh, multi-action configuration, um, it may be the case that uh, some cells have a low voltage uh, break, breakdown voltage. In this case, we have to pay special attention to the to the voltage bias of to the voltage bias of the of the multi-junction cell during uh, the measurement of the bottom junction. In this case, we will have to. A bias the multi junction between 2 and 2.5 uh, voltage, uh, volts. Otherwise, we will obtain the uh, signature from other subcell because uh, at a lower vo uh, bias voltage, uh, the bottom subcell will be no longer limiting the cell structure because it will, be, will enter um, a breakdown uh, region. And it will be, in this case, the middle cell that will limit the structure and will be will not be possible to, to measure. Actually, this effect uh, is shown here in, in this interesting reference where uh, for the measurement of the bottom cell, if we don't apply uh, any voltage, we obtain a signature from the middle cell. This is what we have just mentioned. So only if we apply the appropriate voltage, we obtain the signature from the bottom cell. Okay, this has this uh, another representation of the same effect is as follows. Uh, here showing um, the measurement of the uh, middle cell and the bottom cell. We have the three regions in which, in, in the first one, um, the other subcell is is limiting. Then we have a transition region, and we have the appropriate region where we see the, uh, uh, the signature from the bottom cell. Here we have 
uh, uh, measurement conditions for measuring the bottom cell. And only if we bias appropriately, we see the signature from the bottom cell. Uh, ah, and uh, last artifact uh, that we will mention depends on the position of the cell with respect to the horizontal plane. This will be required in order to uh, measure uh, the quantum efficiency as a function of the of the tilt of the light uh, of the of the incident angle of the light. Sorry, uh, we may want to to do this in order to characterize how do we absorb and collect photons um, uh, regarding uh, not um, uh, collimated light, not light, not um, light uh, that is impinging in the perpendicular axis, uh, but light that is coming with a tilted angle uh, in order to see how the uh, anti-reflective coating is uh, performing or how other effects uh, affect the, the, the performance. Uh, in this case, we will have the uh, QE Cartesian setup in which we implement a degree of freedom uh, of a tilt uh, to make the incident photons uh, a tilt of the solar cell platform, the chuck, in order to, uh, ma uh, to make the uh, ray bundle in pink with a different angle. In this case, we may have the, an artifact produced by a shadowing uh, of the metallization grid. Actually, uh, because the mm, front metallization uh, has some uh, thickness, if the tilt, uh, if the cell is tilted enough, the uh, fingers may shadow or may shade some active parts, active, active portions of the, of the solar cell. And uh, this would reduce the quantum efficiency measure. Uh, we can solve it by varying the angle of the, of the metal grid, the, the, of the fingers, with respect to the tilt angle of the solar cell. At least we have to pay attention to, to perform the measurements always, um, always in the same mm, tilting the solar cell uh, in the same mm, position. We can either do this if we want relative measurements. We can either do this all the time or avoiding uh, most of the shading, we can uh, illuminate always um, uh, taking this orientation into account. And uh, errors that have been measured uh, with large with very tilted angles can be up to 20 percent so this artifact of shading from the front grid uh, may also be um, significant in case we are measuring with a very very with uh, when it is is higher the uh, the higher is the tilt angle of the solar cell so just um, a few words on electronics because i um, I'm really running out of time, and I, I apologize uh, for all the interruptions, and also because I'm probably going a bit too slow. And uh, just the definitions: the definition of the electroluminescence is the light emission from radiative recombination produced by a pin junction that is electrically biased. And this would be the setup that we would use. We would use a CCD camera in order to make an image of the uh, rec uh, radiative recombination. Uh, coming from the solar cell that is uh, voltage biased. And in the case, the particular case of the uh, multi-junction configuration uses um, different uh, bandpass filters in order to select just the emission from each of the subcells uh, at a time. So um, see, th this, is, uh, this is how we will use the uh, electroluminescence applied to a multi-junction solar cell, and this is how um, a system uh, looks like. In this case, it is also the system at the CPB lab at INES in CEA, France, uh, with all the elements that we have just mentioned. Um, th this technique is uh, commonly used for silicon solar cells uh, in order to um, diagnose uh, possible um, defects on the semiconductor or on the uh, mm, dif different elements 
uh, of the of the solar cells, such as the fingers or so, or uh, in general for uh, cracks, micro cracks, and uh, semiconductor defects. Uh, and the, we have to mention then that the, the um, EL, the electrolysis, can be also spectrally resolved. In this case, we need um, we need a, a monochromator, also um, uh, some filters uh, in order to um, to prevent the harmonics and a calibrated detector, etc. What we obtain is for each wavelength the uh, intensity of this radiative recombination. Okay, we have a plot of uh, the emission, the electroluminescence emission from a uh, silicon solar cell, from also this same uh, uh, web page I mentioned before. Uh, but we will try to focus on the spatially resolved luminescence, uh, electroluminescence and not the spectrally resolved. The typical, the typical defects to image are the ones based on a sun type device, uh, sun type defects, which pr uh, are common on germanium cells of triple junction solar cells. Uh, and these, um, these uh, sun type defects produce a, uh, can produce a thermal runaway uh, that can, that significantly impact infant mortality. They are imaged as a dark spot in the in the subcell that uh, has the the sand actually because um, the sand defect uh, produces alternative paths for the current uh, the, the the recombinated current does not is not I mean the current is not recombined uh, through the, the diode of the device, but through this uh, parasitic sun, uh, sun resistance. And uh, this makes th that point, the point where the sun is present, uh, not to recombine radiatively as much as the uh, rest of the cell. And actually, we image a bright spot uh, in the adjacent cells. We uh, This is how we image this uh, type of mm, defects on EL. Here we have a we, we have another um, example in which we have a sand in this small cell. We have a sand in this cell and in the adjacent cells. This would be equivalent to the middle cell, and this would be the bottom and the uh, top cell. And we have an, uh, a more illuminated uh, region uh, where the sand is in the adjacent cells and a less illuminated region in the uh, subcell that has the defect. Uh, we have to mention that the colors are false in this case, okay? In the, in the EL, uh, the CCD camera and the software, the software that controls the CCD camera uh, shows us the intensity of the illuminating, of the illumination through a different uh, co a scale of colors. But uh, we don't pay attention to the color, but to the intensity of the uh, radiation. Uh, with EL, we can also perform um, an analysis of the homogeneity of the solar cells in a wafer, just to um, just to have a, a look on the uh, the quality of the uh, of the semiconductor because. Uh, the solar cells would radiate more when they will be more radiative when the quality of the semiconductor is better. And if we make an analysis of the different cells in um, in a wafer, uh, we can have a a, a, um, a plot, a graph of uh, mm, semiconductor quality in the different uh, regions of the wafer, of the epitaxy wafer. And this can um, give us valuable information on the epitaxy. Uh, uh, then we can also spot uh, high resistance, uh, high sheet resistance. In this case, uh, uh, the recombinated current cannot, uh, uh, is, is not, um, produced between the fingers and is produced next to the fingers because the sheet resistance of the semiconductor is very high or we have we may spot uh, crowding effects because because of a high resistance of the metal fingers or uh, we may spot some 
metallization defects that uh, well may be also spotted uh, uh, with a microscope, but also with um, EL. Uh, actually, since the fingers have been detached in these regions of the solar cell, the, uh, in this case, we also see a crowding effect next to these uh, regions. And we also spot some uh, other defects came from a bad MESA uh, etching, actually, because the MESA uh, probably is not mm, appropriately uh, um, performed here. There's a, a current leakage that also illuminates the adjacent cell when we are biasing uh, uh, the test, this, this, this cell. So we bias the upper cell and there's some current leakage to the adjacent cell and we and this cell is illuminating is uh, relatively recombining this is um, this is an effect this is this is coming from uh, uh, some problem in the mesa etching uh, and then uh, we don't ha we have to um, make a difference between uh, defects coming from the semiconductor uh, against the phase coming from some particles or dust that may be on top of the of the solar cell. Okay, they we may spot some. We, we may think that it is a crack, but we have to uh, observe the surface of the cell with attention uh, because this is not a crack, but just uh, some particle on top of the on the cell. And this is not uh, a semiconductor defect, but just some particle that is blocking the light emit, emitted from the electron electron of the solar cell. Um, and just a uh, final comment on another use of the electroluminescence uh, uh, as the technique called enhanced EL, which is used for the detections of voids in the soldering of the solar cell on a receiver. This was developed by uh, Loic Mabil and in INES and was presented in this in this conference and there is a, a patent as well. Uh, the thing is that in, in for terrestrial uses, multijunctions are soldered to a receiver and it is important to solder the solar cell without voids. Okay, if in case there are voids, a, a thermal runaway can be produced that um, reduce uh, the um, the lifetime of the of the of the device and of the system and so the the um, suppliers of these uh, multijunction um, receivers actually um, use inspection techniques such as uh, x-ray tomography and infrared thermography uh, in order to detect these voids and uh, check whether the soldering has voids or not. Voids are like bubbles, like air bubbles in the soldering, because the soldering of the multijunction is made uh, under a vacuum, in a vacuum soldering uh, process, uh, in order to release the air uh, in, the, in that interface, soldering in interface. There should not be uh, voids in, in this uh, interface. Uh, and, and enhance at EL, which is an electromissions with a very high bias current, is proposed as an alternative technique uh, instead of uh, the more expensive tomography or uh, infrared thermography. Okay, we see here the comparison between the techniques in which the uh, enhanced EL detects uh, the same uh, voids as the other techniques, but hence EL is much simpler, much and much less expensive. Actually, mm, uh, when there is a void, the temperature of the, uh, the, the temperature of, on that region is enhanced because the uh, thermal contact is, is poorer, and then the uh, IV curve uh, on that region uh, is reduced because of the temperature, and then for a same voltage bias, a higher uh, ele electroluminescence is produced. This makes, uh, this produces some uh, regions, this is the, spatial, the, the spatially uh, resolved EL, 
under an enhanced uh, configuration. And we have some regions. Well, this is made of uh, the, the in the sites because of the crowding effect, but we can correct them through uh, correct that um, crowding effect by data processing and obtain the different uh, um, the shape of the of this EL where we can detect some regions that are, are at a high higher temperature and produce uh, an extra EL uh, and this and then with um, uh, also data processing we can just spot this uh, this higher this enhanced electronics and they perfectly match or they match quite well with the uh, with the tomography with the more expensive tomography characteristics. Okay, so we have finished with with the um, uh, course. I'm sorry for the delay. At least, uh, well, in the end, it has lasted for uh, more uh, an hour and a half instead of one hour because of these technical problems. And, uh, well, here you have the summary, but I will not uh, extend further. And now um, I thank you for your attention and propose questions uh, um, from the, uh, from the yeah. people watching. Okay, thank you, Pablo. And, well, uh, you participants may judge it, but I think it was worth uh, entering so much detail because that was uh, part of the intention of this webinar to go to these intricacies of uh, the measurements uh, well it was not the shutdown but uh, that was a special problem of the